Hi everyone. It's a seriously hot day here in London, 32 degrees, hottest day of the year so far. I'm Professor Sarah Rankin and I'd like to welcome you to Imperial's COVID-19 lockdown lessons. Today is lesson six and we will be hearing from Dr. Pantelis Giorgio and Dr. Nick Moser, who are both electrical engineers or maybe I should say biomedical electrical engineers. Anyway, we're going to hear exactly what they are and what they do. Um, and they're going to be talking about um, the work that they've been doing, developing a cheap handheld device for testing to see if people are infected with COVID-19. So as always, please have Mentimeter uh, or Menticom um, open on a web page um, in your phones because they've got quite a few quizzes for you today. So um, hopefully you're going to get involved in those. If you haven't used it before, it's not something you have to register or pay for or sign in for. Um, you just go on to mentimeter.com and then um, we will show you the code for each question as they come up and you just fill in the box. So, um, now, as you probably have gathered through these lessons, I'm essentially a biologist. So first of all, we're going to go to Nick, who's going to tell us a little bit about his backstory and how he became um, an electrical engineer and what exactly electrical engineering is or electrical bioengineering or biomedical engineering, whatever it is. Nick, enlighten us, please. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Sarah. Hi, everyone. As Sarah said, uh, I'm Nick and I'm a research associate within uh, the Centre for Biosphere Technology, which is in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Imperial. This talk will be in two parts. I'll be giving you the first part, which is about introduction to electrical engineering and microchips. You might have a vague idea of what it is. Well, we'll take you a bit through my background and then our journey on how we got to the second part, which is what Pantelis will then talk about. So let me first tell you about my personal inspiration back back when I was in secondary school. Um, they just released the first iPad tablets actually when I finished my secondary school, which makes me sound old now. But I was makes quite... Makes you sound long, young to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so okay. Yeah, no, so, so I was quite impressed by all these things that were packed into this tiny device. You know, in, in an iPad, you've got a camera, you've got gigabytes of memories, you've got big processors that are able to handle trillions of operations per second. Just yesterday, I was using my iPad on my desk and it shut down because it said the temperature was too high. So it has a temperature sensor, it has accelerometer so that you can swap your screens as well. So all these things are kind of a complete mix of disciplines. There's a lot of computing, there's a lot of materials you need to think of the screen. And of course, all behind is what I call electronic engineering. And also you can think of how you integrate this device within the network of smart house as well, being connected to your car and things and things. So being interested in that, I was wondering just to start the Melty for, for everybody. I was wondering if you could answer a quick question for me. And that question is how many chemical elements, you know, you've seen the, the table, Mendeleev table, periodic table of elements, or how many do you think they are in a phone? So the Menti's over here. If I'm, I'm going to give you, what do you say, Sarah, 30 seconds to just log on to the Menti? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing it now. Perfect. We've got eight people so far. There's only going to be four questions to this presentation. This is the, the first one, which we'll use to make sure everybody's OK with it and knows how, how it works. <clears throat> Perfect. Sarah, was that you? No, because I was trying to look in my in my, in my emails for menti.com. So that's uh... <laughs> yeah, very easy. If you that's just not going to work, is it? So. Um... <laughs> 44, 90, yeah. 08. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can still join in in between questions. Enter your name. Yeah. Okay. You can go for a pseudonym. Oh dear. Perfect, we've got 13 people. Question one of four. Where's the question? Shall we go? All right, I'll start it then. Oh, okay. 
Perfect. So the first question should should appear now, which is how many chemical elements are there in your smartphone? Mm. I'm giving you 30 seconds, which is pretty good. <clears throat> Quite a broad choice there. I've done it. Perfect. I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> there we go. I have uh, underestimated everyone giving you 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, perfect. <clears throat> and the answer is 30 plus. So we've got less than 50% that got it. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that even your smartphone is a, a very good piece of engineering and you've seen a lot of chemical engineering in the previous talk. Well, now we're going to go about talking um, electrical engineering particularly. Now, this is not allowing me to go back to presentation mode. So what are all those chemicals? Are you going to tell us that? Yes, there it is. Good questions. So I <laughs> thought actually the part that would have the most chemical would be the screen because you know you've got all these sensors that detect your touch and how you move your fingers. But the electronics as well, as we will discover in this talk, has a lot of material. So the basics of microchips is silicon actually mm -hmm. and there's plenty of different metals that you can add on there so copper silver uh, gold and then there's loads of different materials which are oxides having oxygens and this is without mentioning the battery which has mainly lithium batteries or the casing which can be metallic or or plastic so there's plenty and actually there can be up to 70 elements so this is kind of a of a good example so moving on from there, I started my undergrads in engineering in Belgium, actually. So I'm from Belgium and I got into a major in electronics, as you can imagine me being here now, but also minor in physics chemistry with the idea of, you know, what I've shown you on the slides you might have seen before. You, you probably saw a circuit, but the idea through this talk is to show you that it's not all about the circuit or the molecule. It's how you use them for applications, which we will see is diagnostics. I've had much opportunity to work with practical projects as well. So my first year, um, Belgian roads are really bad. So we had to design uh, robots to fill in potholes. Which is really <laughs> fun. And then we did a soda dry and proofs. This is just examples of engineering in general. Um, and I then specialized more into integrate circuit design or microelectronics when I did my MSc and my PhD at Imperial, which was uh, I started six years ago now. And this will be the main topic of this talk, microelectronics. But before that, I want to make sure everybody knows a bit about electrical engineering as well, because it's very broad, isn't it? Of course, electronics is phone, tablets, wearables, TV. But, you know, this is this is electrical engineering as well. This lights, this renewable energies might it be solar panel or wind turbines as well. And even the SpaceX program used a lot of electronics um, in terms of control, but also electrical engineering with all the power that you can give onto an um, electrical car as well. So it's a very broad definition um, of electrical engineering. But electronics in particular is about the design of microchips. And if you look at a phone, I'll take this one for instance, which is the latest Samsung phone. In there, there's many microchips. There are processors, there's uh, what well, you see again, the battery here. There's all the interfaces to, to SD cards and memories and things and things. So during my PhD, I've had actually the ability, the opportunity to design microchips. So this means we work on a computer design these nice figures here, and these are actually circuits. So if you've seen circuits with resistors, capacitors, they're all around this chip. And each color that you see is a different material or thickness of material. The white here, for instance, is a metal. The yellow is oxide. Um, so there's all kinds of materials that in the end, we like to say is a bit of art because we can add all these. So it's all, all the microchips have a name. This is Batman. So if you were to look mm -hmm. at it under the microscope, you could see all the Batman logos, but the chip actually has several um, applications such as monitoring muscle fatigue or managing diabetes. So it's a kind of a broad thing that we can do. Um, but the chip that we'll talk about in this particular presentation is Titanics, and it was called that way because uh, so I'm Nick, you know that, and I designed it with another Nick, so we decided to call it Titanics. And the bottom part of this figure is when we design it, the top part is when it's under the microscope. So you can see the direct correlation there. And I'm very excited that my next chip is Skywalker. Um, mm -hmm. And I haven't- So you get to name your own chips. Absolutely, yeah. So we that's well, a way that's to reference- Very cool. Chips. You know, that you might give them numbers or things, but we like to give them 
names of things that we like. And then on the microscope, you do see all these logos and yeah, they're kind of Easter eggs for the fans. Yeah. 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 So, so I want to talk a bit about everything that's in this microchip. It's not just colors. Like, like I said, it was circuits and you've seen resistors, capacitors, I hope in, in secondary school. Well, all this is actually based on a device called a transistor. And a transistor is the building block of electronics. It was uh, demonstrated for the first time over 50 years ago in 1947, and it was this gigantic device over here. Um, but then after that, people realized that transistors can be integrated as part of chips, and the very first chip microprocessor was Intel actually in 1971, so over 20 years later. And it already has 2,300 transistors on this little casing here. And this is the picture of the chip. So they're the same. Yeah, I've shown you my chips. This is the first Intel chip, which has given rise later to computers. This is how you make microprocessors inside computers. So I've got now a question for you. You see, we went from very big transistors to small transistors integrated on chips. So how many transistors do you think there are in your smartphone? I'm going to go back to the mentee. I'm going to show you, I've got to show you the leaderboard early on. So this is the leader so far. Yeah, you well done a niche. Now I'm going to go to the next question, which as I said is, how many transistors are there in your smartphone, do you think? Again, transistors to building longer electronics, and I will explain exactly how it works in a second. Do you know about transistors, Sarah? No. <laughs> I no no. So in in this question, we're comparing the amount of transistors to the world's population or the UK I population. I just can't believe you can fit that. How big are <laughs> they? How big are they? That might give me a clue. They can get down to seven nanometers now, probably two nanometers. I think was the latest process. All right. Well, we've got no right answer actually. So there are over ten trillion transistors in your computer of these small devices. Um, Actually, I think the latest Apple has over 100 trillion transistors. So this is how many you've got in there. So we've got a new leaderboard here. All right, so so that's because there's a law, there's an observation that's called Moore's law that states that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit double in about every two years. And it follows this kind of trend over here. And you can pack up more and more of these devices, which means more and more computational power with time. So now we've got microprocessors with trillions of operations per second, technology down to seven nanometers, so that's very small. Um, and then latest units contain over 10 full transistors for just one microprocessor. So I've talked a lot about How transistors. How do you make them though? How do you make them that tiny? So it's actually done through micro nanofabrication procedures. Uh, so you do that in a clean room, in a very purified, clean environment, and you you build them upwards. So first you've got this little substrate here, which, like I said, is silicon, and you can make different regions of these and adding different metals. You add in aluminium, this is oxide, this is silicon dioxide, and by making all these layers, you create a device that's a semiconductor device that will generate a current from a voltage, just mm -hmm. as a big, big black box. That's what it does and the voltage will increase well the higher the voltage the higher the current it's a bit like a dimmer on your yeah. lights the higher you put the voltage the higher you get a current so you've seen resistors before that had also a relationship between voltage and current well this is the transistor so do you actually make these at imperial Have so that's where we can do this or is this something that gets sent away somewhere else to be made so it could be made in different groups the way usually in the great circuit designers do is they design it on the software and then it gets sent to an external fab which or a foundry that will fabricate all these in a specific technology and send you back the chip for testing great so we don't particularly do them um, but some groups do um, in the clean room now now sarah mentioned that we work on biomedical and what i want to say is we actually use these transistors not to give them a voltage but rather to give them a chemical reaction, particularly ions. So what we do is at the surface of that very same chip, we add in a reactions, which as you can see involves DNA, 
and we use that to change the current and hence generate a signal. So in a nutshell, we use the transistor as a chemical sensor with DNA on top. And this, um, just to give you an example, on the left, there's like, a bit like a camera. So there are over a thousand pixels. Each of them is an, uh, is a, an electrochemical sensor. And on the right, if I play the video, you will see that you get a real time image of what happens at the surface. So where you've got sodium and potassium there, are those things that you've added on the top or? Yeah, absolutely. So these are membranes. And so okay. you make all these sensors sensitive to potassium. So if I, when I play this video, what happens is um, I flow in a certain concentration of potassium and only the pixels which have a potassium membrane are reacting. And you'll see that here. There we yeah. go. And you can see the sodium membrane over here. So this is what we call chemical imaging. It's like a chemical camera, really. And it opens up to a whole new possibility, which is called lab on chip testing. The idea of having an entire lab brought on a microchip. And you can put in all sorts of chemical reactions on the top of your microchip and convert them to electrical signal. And that is the very basis of our COVID test. Now, I want to introduce you a little bit about the particular reaction that we do, which is DNA. I hope you've all heard about DNA. You know, there's DNA, there's RNA. And because this presentation will be about COVID, I'll mention that COVID is an RNA virus. So what we're going to try to do is detect the presence of the RNA from the virus on top of the chip. And the RNA, as you probably know, works, um, has four bases, C, G, A, U. And if the particular virus is present, then we will detect it by trying to find a certain sequence. That sequence will indicate that the virus is there and hence be the key to the molecular diagnostics that we're describing in this presentation. So tell me, Nick, what was the first um, application of this sort of chemical you know, chip like you've, you've yeah. described? Good Medical question. application. Well, well, actually, when I started my PhD, most of the focus was around pH sensing, because as Pantelis will explain later, these are uh, ion sensors. And originally we were working with them to detect the pH on top of every sensor and measuring the change for, for different kind of applications. But it's later that we realized that integrating it with DNA, which will release pH, will actually make it a a monitoring device for DNA and RNA as well. So it was kind of bringing molecular biology to the electrical and electronic engineering that got us to bring this device to light, really. Mm. So so I want to emphasize the, the multidisciplinary aspect of this work, and Pantelis will do that even more in the second part of the talk. Yeah. So then, without further ado, I'll move on to uh, introducing Pantelis for the second part of the talk. There we Thanks go. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, so I, Nick's giving you all a, 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 an introduction as to what uh, microelectronics are, and uh, specifically microchips. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the work that we've been doing in harnessing the potential of microchips to create lab on a chip systems specifically looking at detection of infectious diseases. And in the current pandemic, you know, we're addressing COVID-19. So I'm going to show you some of the work we've been doing at rolling out a handheld molecular test that's able to identify if you're infected with the virus. So this is the world we currently live in. I and mean, we're living in, in a new pandemic. Uh, we haven't seen this type of outbreak since the Spanish flu in, in the early 19th century. And it's, it's had a huge impact on all our lives, uh, partially because, you know, it's, it's a virus which can spread very rapidly. And also it's a virus which can affect one's health. And we all know that uh, in the current climate, you know, we've been advised to keep our distance and to lock down to prevent the spread. But, you know, we've all also been in this situation where we woke up in the morning feeling slightly fluey and we're unsure, is it COVID? Is it a flu? Is it the common cold? Or is it just hay fever? 
And it's caused huge distress because, you know, we're unsure what to do. Should we rush to the hospital? Should we self-isolate? You know, self-isolating has, has an impact. We can see it on the economy because you're unable to go back to work. So because of this, you know, there's a huge need now for, for rapid diagnostic tests. Tests that are able to identify if one is infected, is infected. And the UK itself, you know, they've set a very big ambitious target. You know, they want to test 200,000 people every day to see if there's a virus. And as you'll see in my latest slides, you know, current techniques use, use a lab-based test. But in my research, you know, we're, we're, we're looking forward into the future and we're wondering, what if there existed a device similar to this device that was available around when I was a teenager doing my A-levels, which could you could hold in the palm of your hands and by inserting a cartridge, it could tell you what virus you had. Hopefully by the end of my talk, I'm going to convince you that this device isn't just science fiction, it's actually something real and something that we're using to, to address COVID-19. But as Nick, Nick uh, and Sarah have already said, you know, um, I'm not a biologist or a medic, you know, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer and I spent a lot of my time designing microchips, you know, the little piece of sil sil silicon that Nick showed you, you can see one sitting on the tip of my finger here, which contain billions of transistors which are on a nanometer scale. That's why microchips are micro scale, but I call it a nanotechnology because it's on the nano scale. And what these chips are, are really good for is creating what's called a system on a chip which is basically a system which performs a, f a function, an autonomous function. And in our application of lab on a chip, we can integrate thousands, if not millions of sensors to do a, a, to create a total analytic system which can interrogate a sample. Well, that's not the only thing that we do. I mean, my lab at Imperial College is very much focused on using microchip technology to innovate the next generation of medical devices, which addresses the current challenges we're seeing in healthcare. And it's consisting of, of three distinct areas, just for your education. We look at what's called bio-inspired design. Where we try and make, create artificial systems which replicate the functionality of, of a biological system to offer treatment. And here's an example of what we call an artificial pancreas, which substitutes a biological pancreas and offers full glucose control for type 1 diabetes. In the lab on a chip space, let me just go back, we talk about integrated sensing systems. So it's again, chips with thousands of sensors able to look at uh, a sample and tell you what, what it has. And combining the two, we can also put things on the body. So looking at wearable monitoring systems, which can monitor your physiology in real time and communicate to a mobile phone, giving a more accurate diagnosis of one's health. But the other area which, which we're focusing on is deploying technologies where they're most needed. And a lot of the work I've been doing over the last five years has been looking at these types of settings, the low middle income countries, which they don't have an abundance of resources or access to big community hospitals. They need to provide healthcare in rural settings with very low resources. So a lot of my work has been looking at creating technologies which are able to identify infectious diseases which can be used in these sorts of settings. And I'll show you some of our work in dengue and malaria leading up to our current working code. So I hope I've convinced you uh, that there is an urgent need for rapid diagnostics. I mean, it's not just for COVID, it's for all infectious diseases, because if you can diagnose something early enough, then you can actually uh, manage its, 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 its spread, but also treat it promptly. And if you treat it promptly, it might be curable. Also, there's a huge area of what we call antimicrobial resistance, looking at the misuse of antibiotics, which could yield them ineffective uh, which would be a, a catastrophe in terms of treatment of infectious diseases. But being, a, being able to diagnose what the correct bacterial infection is, or even just to discriminate if your infection is a bacterial virus, you'll know what antibiotic to use and therefore uh, reduce antimicrobial resistance. And obviously looking at reducing the length of hospital stays and limit infection within hospitals and in the community, you need a rapid diagnostic test. And that's why the, the World Health Organization has been on the news, you know, talking about the, these tests and, and their urgent need. Well, let's look at what, what currently exists. I mean, this is a slide I put to show that, you know, diagnostics isn't something new. I mean, they were invented over 500 years ago. But back then, the state of the art, as you can see from this slide, was called the uroscopy wheel. So if you presented yourself with uh, an infection or an illness, your clinician 
would walk up to you and ask you to urinate in a flask. And then based on the color of your urine, he'd use his chart, which was called the uroscopy wheel, to identify what was your infection. However, you, I think you tend to agree with me that this is probably not the most accurate way of diagnosing an infection. And we can do a lot better. And we can do a lot better because we can design state-of-the-art technologies. And what I like uh, about this, which, are, which is called the ASSERT criteria, this is actually the, the guidance which has been given to us by the World Health Organization. As an engineer, we spend a lot of our time designing specifications. And they've given us a spec sheet as to what a rapid diagnostic test should do. It should be affordable, such that it's deployable, less than 10 pounds per test. It should be sensitive, meaning that it can detect if the virus is present, even if it's in a low concentration. That's important because viruses, as the days progress, you know, they, they tend to replicate. So if, it's, if the test is very sensitive, they'll be able to detect it very early on. It needs to be specific, meaning if you're looking for a specific virus, meaning if I'm, if I'm looking for COVID, it needs to tell me exactly that it's COVID. And it's user friendly. I mean, I tell this to all my researchers, you can design the world's best technology in the lab, but if it's not usable, it's going to have no impact. So it needs to be user friendly. And a lot of the technologies we design are in, in with end users in mind. So we do a lot of co-design with our clinicians and epidemiologists as part of our team. It needs to be rapid. So it needs to give you a result in under two hours. And it needs to be robust so that it's got longevity. I say equipment heat free, so it's portable and ultimately deliverable to end users. So if we look at the current state of the art in terms of COVID, uh, we've heard about the swabs and the big centers which, are which have been set up to allow people to go and give a swab. So you can swab basically your, your nose or your, your, your throat and you send that off to a lab. And it can take a few days. The lab needs dedicated expertise and also sophisticated equipment. So it's very user dependent. However, it is very, very sensitive uh, so it will definitely tell you that you have COVID uh, and, and what concentration and it's quantitative as well. So it'll tell you how much pathogen you have in your blood. Uh, and that will, will then signify how, how severe the infection is. On the other end of the spectrum, we've heard about a lot of these rapid diagnostic tests, the so-called antibody tests, which uh, they're very, very rapid. However, they tell you if you've had the infection, not if you're infectious. So it, it tells about the antibodies which your, your body produces as a result to, to COVID and it, it, it tells you if you've passed through an infection but it won't tell you if you have the infection at that, that specific point. Uh, they're, they're quite quite nice because they don't need any expertise you know it's a very simple test you can just give it a drop of blood and it gives you a result and it's very very cheap however as I said it's post-infection and it's, it's qualitative so it won't give you a, a, an indication as to what virus if you have the virus and what the viral load is. By far, the state of the art that we've been hearing about is these PCR tests, the polymerase chain, chain reaction tests, which are based on molecular methods, which molecular methods, they look uh, specifically at identifying the DNA or the viral RNA in a sample. So they're very sensitive and very specific and quantitative, but the time can be anywhere between two and four hours. You still need to send the sample off to a lab, still need this, needs this big bulky equipment, and it requires expertise to, let, to run, run the equipment. So our view is the best uh, diagnostic should have a combination of these two. You know, it should, should have this, the sophistication of an RT-PCR, rapid uh, polymerase chain reaction molecular test, but also the simplicity of a rapid diagnostic test. And that's what we aim to, to achieve with our technology. So we've got a Menti question here. So what are antibody and molecular tests used for? Nick? Over to you. So you can see the questions. Yeah, there you go. This one, if you've uh listen to Pantelis, you should definitely know. Amazing. Perfect. Right. Well and then we've got one last question. 
after leaderboard updates. Yay, well done, Sarah. <laughs> uh, and there we go, that's the last question. So, these kids are still beating me. Jeez. So what are molecular tests used for? And this will be very important because Hanselis will be talking about our molecular tests in, in the rest of his presentation. And these are the PCR tests. I'm, I'm really intrigued to hear because I know PCR is very much temperature dependent. So in, intrigued to see how you get around that. Absolutely. All right. There we go. We're done with our menti test for the day. Oh, yeah. Sarah, you well did done a fair. Everyone. Yeah. 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 Well OK, done, well done, guys. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> you beat <laughs> the <laughs> professor. It's my slowness in reading, I'm afraid. I'm saying oh. that's my excuse. <laughs> All right, let's go back to uh, back to our slides. slides. Yes. Yep. So, yeah, as you quite rightly identified, molecular tests tell you if you've had the infection, if you have the infection, and you can see here on the blue curve, this, this is uh, days of exposure to the COVID virus, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and you can see week on week how the virus evolves. You develop symptoms, so you'll get uh, a PCR positive here because you've got lots of virus uh, flowing through your, your sample. And then as you get better, it tails off. So it's unlikely to be detected by a PCR, but then you develop antibodies. So then the antibody test will be able to tell if you've had COVID, but it won't tell you if you're infected with COVID. Okay. And here's a nice uh, uh, um, figure, which, you know, it gives a, a very brief uh, comparison between the two, you know, between the antibody test, which is a blood test and the swab test, which is a diagnostic test. And, you know, we know that the antibody tests are very rapid. Uh, and this was, I, I got this off the BBC News this morning, where they say that the molecular test for, for COVID, you know, it takes days. But what I'm going to convince you is that that's not days, it's actually 20 minutes in, in, in using our technology, which is comparable to the antibody tests. And that's enabled by our microchips, because with our microchips, we can integrate thousands of sensors on a tiny chip which can interrogate the DNA. And because the microchip itself has the sensors, we don't need any, any bulky instruments similar to the PCR machine, which, which uses optics. So we can make something which is lab free. Also, because on the chip, we also put the instrumentation, sorry, Nick, we've lost the slide, we put the instrumentation, which actually can interrogates the sensor. We can actually detect with very, very low levels uh, of noise which allows us to be very, very, very sensitive. Also, because we're making, uh, we're using a microchip similar to, for example, your mobile phone camera, which is so many megapixels, in a similar fashion, we can have thousands, if not millions of chemical sensors. And then using our chemical transistors, which are called ion sensitive effect transistors, you know, it's a proven method which we can use to reliably detect if you, if the DNA is present in the sample. Because as I'll show you, is that these pH sensors detect the release of protons as the DNA binds to uh, a complementary target. And as Nick showed, this is our flagship chip, Titanix, which contains 4,000 sensors. And what these 4,000 sensors do is look at uh, the presence or the absence of uh, a pathogen in a sample. And the way it does that is you've got basically, we design what's called a primer, so it's almost like a probe, which identifies if the SARS-CoV-2 virus is present. And then when you give it the, the, the target sample, which has the genetic material, uh, which uh, is, is identified if the patient's infected, uh, in the presence of a, an enzyme called DNA polymerase, it causes an extension. We know DNA binds to its complementary, and so DNA binds to a T and a C to a G in a double key structure. And that reaction extends the DNA chain and it releases protons, hydrogen ions which as the hydrogen lines are being released, our pH sensors detect the change in pH. And that confirms if the sample is positive for COVID 
or negative. So pH change signifies that you're positive. If there's no pH change, then it's negative. And that's what we've done. We've taken the chip, we've integrated it with microfluidics, we've put the sophisticated molecular methods on top, which identify if you're positive or negative. And Sarah talked about amplification. So a polymerase chain reaction uh, system needs to cycle through two temperatures or three, depending on the system, to amplify the DNA. And that's by naturally denaturing the DNA and, and recombining it in a process to in increase the number of copies in the sample and get a larger signal. And we do that as well with our system, but we use an isothermal method because we want to make a portable system. So we're able to do DNA amplification just by operating at a single temperature. And that just adds to the, 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 uh, the, so the simplicity of our approach, looking towards making a handheld test. And as I mentioned, because a lot of our work is focused on low middle income countries, we leverage consumer electronics. You know, somebody else has done the work for us in getting these things incredibly cheap. So we use standard printed circuit boards, as you would find in any consumer electronic device. Also, the microchip is made in exactly the same foundries or factories which make the microprocessors for your iPhones. And then we 3D print our microfluidics, which is used to channel the sample on top of the device. And our current cost for this, this test, this cartridge, is £11. And that's for manufacture a thousand of them. Obviously, if we scale them to millions, it will be a lot cheaper. But just, just to compare, a, a similar test of, of, of a molecular diagnostic within a hospital would probably cost about £60. So already six times cheaper uh, than that. And we can also compartmentalise this to look at more than one infection. And I'd like to introduce the lace wing, which after a handheld molecular diagnostic test, now you can see you take the cartridge and you plug it in a, a handheld reader, which does the, the heating of the sample for the amplification. And in real time, it detects if the sample is present and then communicates that to your mobile phone. But an innovation that we've added is at the point at which it detects a sample, we also geotag the result. And that's important because we can also do real time surveillance. So at the moment that the handheld test identifies that the sample is, is present and it also is infected with COVID, it pins a point on, on a map and then in real time can do outbreak prediction which is used for real-time surveillance of the, of the infection. And I've got a nice video for you here, which shows the device in action. So you can see it's very, very small and portable. You know, it's, it's roughly the size of the palm of your hand. It's smaller than an Android phone. You turn on the device and you plug in the cartridge. And then on the phone, you pair the phone to the device and then it outputs the output of the the sensor array, and you give it your sample, which is a patient sample, and you also give it a control. The control is important because it's used as a method to signify that what you're detecting is in fact the ground truth. And the output is shown on the phone in real time, it's geotagged and it's uploaded to the phone. And before working on COVID, obviously, we were doing a lot of infectious diseases, looking at antimicrobial resistance. And this slide shows a head-to-head -head comparison of our handheld molecular test, that big bulky instrument, which I showed you in my earlier slide. And you can see here like-for-like -like, uh, res responses in terms of amplifying if the pathogen is present or not, uh, showing that we can detect uh, if you're infected. In this case, we're looking at an enterobacteria resistant gene for antimicrobial resistance. And we were able to show separation of the amplification of the sample in the control. You can see it gets separated just over seven minutes. So we were able to reliably identify in under seven minutes that the patient was infected with this resistant gene. Moving on, looking at uh, infectious diseases as well. Uh, last summer, we sent the team to Ghana and we showed that we could detect malaria in real time. So we showed we could detect malaria in Ghana in under 15 minutes. And also we showed that the platform was portable and mobile. You can see my PhD students here, Ivan and Kenny, running the tests. And also we, we proved that the device is quantitative as well, in that it can tell you exactly how much uh, sample of uh, virus is in, in the amount of virus that, that's in the sample as well, which is important to see kind of the disease progression. And we've actually been working prior to COVID on a range of infectious diseases, and it's a big global collaborative effort. You know, we've been working in Ghana, looking at malaria, 
within the UK, we've been working on also antimicrobial resistance, uh, looking at also uh, Aspergillus, which is a respiratory pathogen. And with Thailand, Vietnam and Taiwan, we've been looking at dengue, which is which is a huge tropical infection. And also in Cape Town and South Africa, we've been diagnosing tuberculosis. So prior to February, you know, we have we had active efforts in all these infectious diseases. Uh, and now, obviously, with the, the emergence of COVID-19, we repurposed our diagnostic and we focused all our efforts in addressing this current pandemic. So the moment COVID-19 happened, uh, as a lab, we said, OK, we need we need to do our part. We need to try and apply this technology and see if we could use our molecular test to diagnose COVID-19 in the palm of your hand in under 20 minutes. So when lockdown happened, uh, fortunately enough, we were able to keep the lab going, you know, obeying social distancing and proper measures such as face masks. And the team worked uh, to try day and night to try and repurpose a diagnostic uh, for COVID-19. And I'm pleased to say, as I'll show you from our results, that it has been a success. Just to show you an animation of how our test works. Um, again, it's a handheld molecular test for COVID-19. It works of a nasal or pharyngeal swab. So you, you take the swab and you put it in a, in a tube. The, from the tube, we then take out the sample, uh, but the, the reaction mix in the tube converts the RNA into DNA, which we can then amplify on our, our chip. The chip, obviously, as, as I've said, is based on microchip technology, similar to your smartphones. And when the reaction amplifies, it releases protons, uh, which detects if your or the sample has SARS-CoV-2. And that is sent in real time to your smartphone app, which gives a result in under 20 minutes. And the results are synchronized with geotag for real time surveillance of epidemics. So I'm pleased to report our first results. I mean, we've tested uh, heavily with samples coming from Charing Cross Hospital over the last three months. And as a result of our first phase validation, uh, you know, for 50 samples, uh, you can see here a very nice uh, separation between positive and negative, and all our samples amplified, confirming the virus was present in under 20 minutes. And also, we had very good sensitivity, the limit of detection down to 10 copies per reaction, all running on parallel uh, lace wings, uh, communicating to the smartphones in the labs. So it's a very good result for us, which we're about to publish. And, you know, we're fortunate that, uh, you know, it's it's a mobile platform. So looking forward to the next phase uh, when there'll be an outbreak, we can test this in, in the community. It gives real time results. It's lab free. It's low cost. It's sensitive, specific and quantitative. So it's got the sophistication of the molecular PCR and it can detect in under 20 minutes. But it's also adaptable to new pathogens within a month. So we showed through through this exercise and some previous exercises as well that we've done in antimicrobial resistance. The, upon emergence of a new pathogen, we can repurpose the technology to identify that pathogen within a month and, and roll out a test. So it's very versatile. And I'm pleased that we, we managed to secure a, a fund from Imperial College from the Imperial College Re Re COVID Research Fund. And the objective from of that fund was to allow us to scale the technology. So we're now scaling it to be able to produce a thousand tests per month. We'll also look at rolling it out in, in, within the NHS. So we're going to do a, a large scale clinical trial over the summer uh, in Charing Cross Hospital, uh, comparing life for life with, with, with the molecular biology tests which, which currently exists. We're also looking forward to, to our current research. You know, we're also looking at deploying in low middle income countries as well which, uh, you know, I, I think there'll be a huge need there, as I, as I mentioned earlier in my slide, because in dealing with infectious diseases, they, they may not have access, you know, in the rural areas to, to big bulky sophisticated equipment. And the other thing I'd like to, to show is our real time reporting system as well. You know, we can do real time surveillance uh, and we've, we've made a tool similar to the ones that you've, you've seen on the news recently, which in real time, you know, the diagnostic communicates to the cloud and in real time it's mapped uh, to, to our surveillance system, which shows where the infections are taking place and we can get good statistics and predictions for outbreaks. And looking forward, you know, I, I hope there isn't going to be a second wave, but in the event that there, there is, you know, because the technology is mobile, you know, we can roll it out in, in, in a lab, in a boot, as, as we call it, uh, where the test can be mobile and used, you know, to, to screen, you know, in 
in, in communities, looking at care homes, for example, or schools. So I started off with this vision, you know, uh, a molecular test which could be fit in the palm of your hand. And I hope I've convinced you that this isn't science fiction, it's a reality. And, you know, we're moving forward with COVID, but we have to bear in mind, you know, after COVID, there's still a huge amount of uh, infections that still need, need uh, this potential of this technology. And we'll, we'll be working hard to try and deliver the diagnostic for, for those infections as well. We'll also, you know, focus our efforts on usability as well. You know, we want this to test to be easy to use and simple such that, you know, it could be deployed and used by unskilled users. And we're very passionate. I mean, we really enjoy what we're doing as electronic engineers working in, in biomedical engineering. And, and as Einstein says, you know, you, you never fail until you stop trying. And, you know, we'll, we will be trying because, you know, it's a very enjoyable uh, career to be in. And I, and I highly encourage any, any student thinking of taking up this career path. You know, it's very, very rewarding and to continue. And on that note, you know, I'd like to also acknowledge, you know, the great team I have behind this and also the, my multidisciplinary collaborators, because it's not just an effort from electronic engineering. It's an effort which combines multiple disciplines from, as you can see, it's electronics, there's molecular methods, but there's also medicine all coming together to, to deliver, you know, something which is, uh, at least we think is, is an innovation for, for molecular diagnostics in COVID-19. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all for, for listening and pass over to Sarah, which I think will uh, open the floor up for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Pantelis. That was so impressive. Wow. Um, it's incredible and really super exciting that you've um, managed to do that so quickly. I mean, that's going to be, a, you know, it looks like a real game changer. And just the, the fact that you can adapt that that same technology to different infections um, within that time frame is is really impressive. Although I know that involves a huge amount of work and that you've got a whole team there sort of, you know, and lots of incredibly clever people all sort of putting their minds to it. But I think that's what is exciting about being a scientist is that, you know, you're working together with other people that are really clever and you're coming up with all these ideas and you're problem solving and you need somebody um, like Pantelis that has that vision that thinks, yeah, this is what we want to do. It's a bit like when Steve Jobs was sort of, you know, developing Apple computers, you know, he didn't know quite how he was going to get there or how to get something, you know, looking so beautiful and, and being so um, uh, functional as the, say, the iPhone. But he just had that first vision and then they just went for it. And the same with the sort of SpaceX rockets and things and Elon Musk, you've got to have somebody have the vision and then, you know, you have a team of people all working towards it. And it is really um, super exciting. And especially because you can have this huge impact and this will clearly have an impact. And more importantly, I think for us, although it's going to have an impact, obviously within the UK, it's the fact that it can have a global impact. It can have um, these, um, we can take it, or well, they can take it into other parts of the world that, um, is not so technologically advanced, where they don't have the um, resources, um, both in terms of money, but also maybe in terms of trained, trained scientists, big, big hospitals, big testing labs, to be able to test for sort of these infectious diseases. So that will be really critical. So I've got loads of questions, but um, I'm going to hand it over to you, Margarita. Um, well, what did you think of that? first of all, and, and are there any questions? Actually, I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. I think I'm useless because I can't do any of these things. You know, I feel really basic. Anyway, um, our listeners have a lot of questions about um, when these chip will be available into the market and if they can buy it or not. Um, so could you just clarify some things about it? Dr. Yeah. So, so I can talk a bit about that. So as with any uh, test coming out of a lab, there needs to be certain procedures which need to be followed before you're allowed to deploy it uh, and, and put it on the market. Um, because you can't, you know, create technologies and just sell them. They need to be regulated. And that's why we've, we've got agencies like the FDA or the MHRA here in the UK. Uh, obviously, they're, they're working with us closely because there's a huge need for, you know, rapid deployment of these types of tests. 
So in answering the question when it when it's going to be available in the market, I mean, there's two things which we're aiming to achieve in the next year. One is to do the large scale validation, which we'll be conducting over the next few months, you know, testing over a thousand samples and showing it's showing concretely, you know, the evidence that the device uh, accurately detects COVID-19 as we've already proven in the lab. And the second is to get approval from the MHRA. So we need to see mark the technology, create a technical folder and apply to the MHRA with all our, our results and data. And then they, they need to give us the approval that the device is, is ready for you know, to, to be to be deployed. So, you know, it could take anywhere between a year to a few years, uh, but obviously with, with the, the current pandemic, you know, everybody's working on very accelerated timescales and so are we. Yeah, you are right. Um, are you thinking of selling this, the patent or the device into other countries so as to have a broader spectrum of the state? So in answering that, um, the answer is yes. Uh, I mean, we're fortunate at Imperial to, to have uh, Imperial Enterprise, which is our technology transfer arm, and we've been working also closely with them, looking at how we can protect our innovation, obviously through patenting globally, but then also how we can, we can deploy it and get it used. And there's several strategies which we're evaluating in, in doing that, uh, but you know the, the target is to go global. Obviously, starting locally first because our our first priority, you know, is is to to help the UK and uh, address the current challenges we're seeing here in the UK. Great, thank you. I hope you do you sell these things in Greece as well because we need them. <laughs> Um, so, um, are these yeah, things? that's a good point, actually, Marguerite. It would be great thing to have in airports, wouldn't it? Because then yeah. you could immediately, you know, be able to test people coming in in into a country. Yep, it's something we've actually actively discussed. Uh, it, it is one of the use cases because you can see how a twenty-minute molecular test. Um, you know, it's, it's it's very deployable in an airport, and and you know, it, it could either be on arrival or even when you check in. You know, by the yeah, time stop you stop people getting your baggage. Yeah. yeah. But in that yeah. time before, you know, from from baggage drop to to, to getting to the gate, you know, there's, there's definitely mm. more than twenty minutes. But again, you know, deploying a test to be run in an airport, obviously, it's not something that we're going to decide where it fits into the flow. Uh, but you can see how being rapid, you know, gives, uh, you know, the, the people at the airport many, many options as to what its, its deployability is. Yeah. Sure. Um, one of our listeners have another interesting question. Um, are these results available to the public? It has to do with uh, the surveillance of the pandemic. You said that we're using Bluetooth, we can have yeah. a geotropic. Yeah. So the results from our tests is is available to to us, but the results of all the diagnostic tests that mm -hmm. have been carried out by the UK government for COVID-19 are available in a real time map uh, that's been posted on the, the UK Gov website. And I, you know, I'd highly recommend somebody that's interested to go and see it because it's very nice because you can see uh, COVID statistics, you know, live as they're coming. Um, it's very helpful for us as well because, you know, we can see according to our postcode, for example, how many reported cases there's been in the last two weeks, uh, in the yeah. last two weeks. And, and that, that gives you kind of a sense of confidence that, you know, if there haven't been a lot of reported cases, then uh, then the risk of you contracting COVID is probably minimal. Can we put that? We, um, we have to. Can we can we put that um, the link to that website in the in the um, chat or the the yeah, in the, the chat? That would yeah, be great we can, to send yeah. it. And um, yeah, I just think though another important thing that even though you are looking at say the where that person is, so if that person is in northwest London or whatever, you not when people are being tested, no information is going out on a, a public website that says this person this the name of the person so you yeah, don't know everything has case. to be anonymized yeah everything is so anonymized. i think that's really important to me pri privacy is is of utmost importance and, and that that's why i said you know early on you can't exactly make a device and then just go sell go sell it you have to comply with all the standards which are in place 
And yeah. we know there's been a lot of a lot of effort now in protection of people's privacy. And you know, there's been a huge effort in the last few years of, of, of getting basically standards in place to allow that. And we conform to those standards uh, because anonymity is key. Uh, yeah. We only put, we only give information which will help us deal with the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. Really important. Tell me, why is it called Lacewing? Where did that come from? You you're very keen on naming things. Your, your lab, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> we like I names. Remember back in the back in yeah, I won't say what what year, but when people used to name genes. And I remember when they named Sonic and Hedgehog gene. Um, that shows my age. <laughs> So I'll let Nick answer this question. Yeah, yeah. So actually, there's re there's two reasons really. Um, so a lace wing is actually a bug that hunts and kills other bugs. So we thought for the image, that's what we're doing with all the viruses and bacteria. Also, it technically stands for location aware counter epidemic wireless ISFET networking, but that's okay. more of a background. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's how we nice. called it. Nice. 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 Very good. Margarita, any other questions? Um, actually, I have a question that I want Nick to answer. Um, as you know, Sarah, we have some fans that are, that are constantly online to see lockdown lessons, and I just want to honor her. Uh, so she's asking, of how can we make microchips? How can we make microchips? So yeah. it's a good question. So, so. I've mentioned you can make devices in the clean room with facilities uh, at Imperial. But if you want to make a full microchip, usually what you do is use um, a circuit design software and use kind of uh, all the software suite to make all the shapes of all the metal, all the material on top of each other and make the function of the circuit. And you would then send it to a foundry to be made. Now, there are some foundries that are much cheaper than others for characterizations of circuits. Um, I might mention XFAB, uh, but I think the best way, if you want to make a microchip, the best way is definitely to get into electronic engineering and get those courses to learn how to do it. And then, and then you'll get opportunities at probably end of undergrads or master's level to go and make a, a microchip. Anyone can contact us for more more questions and you know as well if they think of anything else later. And it's I mean from all those sort of different applications and I mean just you know it's everywhere isn't it and you know it's certainly electrical engineering is something you're never going to be without a job I would suggest. Probably that's true yeah it always evolves you know I talked to yeah. you about Moore, Moore's law how every two years um, you can put more transistors in the same area, which means you can get more computational power, more everything. So people say it will start saturating, but the point being there is always progress. There is always more to be done and new technologies to go and test and design with. So this is what I want to know is if do you think we're going to get to the point where you're going to have this sort of technology in something like a tissue or on a door handle such that you know, when you touch a handle or somebody touches a handle with an infected hand, that it's going to glow up or the tissue is going to change colour if you've got a viral infection. I can answer oh. that. So, yeah, I mean, you, you, you've, you've actually identified the next wave of, of electronics and microelectronics. So there's a lot of research going into looking at making flexible electronics and that's mm. ta taking these chips and their capability and making them in flexible substrates which can conformally sit on things. You know, in our lab, we're putting it on, on our bodies, looking at, you know, we're wrapping things around our arm, looking at sweat as a biomarker. There's yeah. been works where, you know, you, you can put them on buildings and things. And within those, you know, like as you mentioned, in the door handle, you can imagine the door handle would then integrate millions of chemical sensors, which then can identify if the, if the virus is present, for example. And you can also integrate things which, which, which create light, for example. And it could signify if, uh, if you know, give, give an integration of, of what's happening. There's also some work done on uh, electronic tattoos. That you've seen in the past. That, that, that's the nickname right. that they've given. Right. Okay. That's. Um, but so I guess the question is that 
is your tech I mean I'm assuming your technology is single use or is it multiple use so once you've used a chip yes it's, it's, it's single use it's single use uh, and that's because of uh, you know the application we're working in infectious diseases when you're dealing with an infected oh. sample you don't want to reuse it however if if we're using it for other applications where it's not so uh, critical that uh, you know, you dispose immediately of, of a sample, they can be reused um, because the technology is robust in that sense. Yeah, because I'm thinking, OK, a tissue you throw away, but a door handle, you don't, you know, you'd have to make it something that reset after you cleaned it or yeah. whatever. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and we do a lot in, in, so you use the word reset, which uh, is something also we've worked on a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, in that we make the try to make these systems adaptable to the environments that they're exposed in. So in real time, you know, the systems have to basically learn and compensate to be reliable. Because as things progress, you know, the sensors, uh, you know, the, the environment that the sensors are in may change, and the system needs to be able to adapt to that. And that, that's another engineering application where you look at, you know, output responses and they develop methodologies to compensate for those. Cool. Margarita, other, any other questions? There is another one. Um, I'm not quite sure how I can elaborate that. The actual question is, do you think there will be a time where people will be forced to take this microchip test? And um, I think that the question should be like in case that we have, we are forced to do this test, will it be available to massive um, production? So, so that's that's our ambition. Um, I want it to be as simple as possible so that you wouldn't mind just going to Boots, picking one up and just running the test. Uh, obviously, you can't force people to test. It has to be entirely on you. But we know, you know, there's many other tests uh, which you can just go and buy off the shelf, which you're comfortable doing. Um, and like a pregnancy that, test. Yes, like a pregnancy test. And we, we hope that, you know, our that's that's part of our target product profile you know as so I mentioned part of the vision you know it's it's simple enough you can go pick pick one off, off the, the counter run a test and it will accurately confirm what you're infected with and, and i think it's important to note that you know we're, we're talking about covid but we're we're actually making on the same chip we're, we're compartmentalizing to look at many infections so again the vision is you you're feeling ill you give it a sample it won't tell you only if you've got COVID, you know, if it, it isn't COVID, it'll tell you if it's flu, you know, it could be influenza, it could tell you, you know, some other emergent strain of pathogen. So, so our plan is to have a panel of markers on a single use mm -hmm. cartridge, uh, which will signify, you know, some of the more, more prevalent infections, which are, which are, uh, which are around at the current time. Ah, so I'm thinking another, another great application for this would be when you go and donate blood, when you go and donate blood, you know, you give all the, you give your pint of blood and then they take loads of test tubes and they go and check that you haven't got lots of infectious diseases before they can use the blood. Um, and obviously if you do happen to have something or caught something, they will inform you. So this would just be perfect to actually go in and have this test before you actually give the blood. It would be hugely, um, exactly, save exactly. a lot of money. Oh. Great, write that patent quick. Right, <laughs> um, how many patents have you got on this anyway? Because I think this is the other thing, guys. I mean, as scientists, this is what we do. We are inventors and that's why we have patents and anybody that's um, watched Dragon's Den will know the importance of having <sighs> a, having things patented. So um, yes. yeah, so how, how many patents have you guys got? So we've got quite a few. Um, and we've got more coming. And uh, I mean, at the moment we've got we've got five. And nice. obviously, through through our initiatives in, in in what we've been doing, there's a lot more coming. And again, we're working closely with Imperial to to release those. Um, but again, uh, you know, because Imperial is very focused on on uh, enabling technology transfer, you know, it's great to, to have that option as 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 a scientist to basically see the translation of, of the research. Yeah. And I think this is another great example of how, as, as 
you know, through lots of these talks, we can see the, you know, scientists from different areas, different disciplines working together and particularly working. Um, I mean, I think because we are talking about COVID, you know, all the applications are, are medical and um, but it's, you know, again, it's great to see. I um, do a lot in terms of interviewing for medical students and I always say to medical students, people that want to become a doctor, you know, why do you want to become a doctor when you could become a scientist? Because imagine the impact of your invention, you know, if you find the cure for cancer, if you find the 20 minute test for COVID, the impact of that in terms of the number of people and lives that you could save um, is much greater. So, um, and I think people just, you know, haven't maybe thought about that um, initially yeah, I mean, because they it, think it, it, about saving lives as actually, you know, doing exactly. the heart resuscitation yeah, it, or whatever. I guess you've got a point. It's really been a roller coaster, right? You know, we know six years ago I started on this project as complete electronic. I had no idea what an antibody test or molecular tests were, right? Then we brought in molecular biologists, learned loads about all these detection methods, and now we're we're organizing clinical trials, thinking of patterns. You're absolutely right. This is an important phase of it, um, writing patterns. So it's kind of great uh, background and, and and yeah, path so far. It's really exciting. Great. I, I mean, I just I could chat forever, but I realize we're way over time. So I'm going to um, have to say, um, you know, goodbye and thank you so much because that was really, really interesting. I'm, I'm right. Yeah, so impressed. So really, um, thanks to Pantelis and Nicholas, because you've really explained that really clearly to us as well, even for us um, biologists. Um, thank you, Margarita, for moderating the session and again for um, Sam for producing the session. session. So we're going to be back um, and unusually this week, we're going to be back next week on Monday um, and at two o'clock and we're going to hear from Professor Peter Openshaw and Dr Ryan Thwaites. Now, Peter is a clinical scientist trained as a medical doctor, but then does research. Um, and he has been leading on some of the major national clinical research projects, um, collecting, for example, blood and lung tissue from patients infected with COVID-19. And then they've been investigating the immune response. He's also leading on some of the clinical trials, so testing how effective different drugs are for treating the disease. And finally, he's one of the scientists recently recruited as an advisor for the government. That's why we've had to cha change the time and date of his talk. So um, he's incredibly busy and he's going to be joined by Ryan, who is actually one of the scientists working in this group doing much of that lab work. So I'd like to um, yeah, invite you to join me again. It's going to be another fascinating talk. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, please fill in the survey and in the chat um, and enjoy the rest of the day and and indeed the weekend. And I hope to catch up with you on Monday and just to say goodbye from all of us. Goodbye, everyone. Hi, thank you very Bye. much. Thank you very thank much. You. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.